Uh, the Star of Bethlehem isn't actually mentioned explicitly in the Bible. There's nothing called the Star of Bethlehem. But there is a star that leads wise men or magi to Bethlehem. Yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of often touted as potentially an astronomical event, that the, you know, these wise men coming from the east were tipped off by some uh, astronomical event, something going on in the sky. This is only in Matthew, so it's only spoken about in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 2. But there, initially, the star doesn't lead the Magi or the wise men to Bethlehem at all. It leads them to Jerusalem. And there, they, uh, well, they go to King Herod, who is the uh, ruler of the Jews. Uh, and he says to them, well, well, I'm not sure. And so he summons the sort of chief priests and the scribes and asks them, where would the king of the Jews be born? Uh, and they reply with some words from Micah uh, that he'll be born in Bethlehem. And so this, but over the years, you know, it's one of those things that astronomers like to play around with because the nice thing is, at least some things in astronomy, we can actually date extremely well. We can actually predict when things happen, like when planetary conjunctions, when planets come close together in the sky and those kinds of things. So it's kind of been a, a, a game that astronomers have played from time to time to try and predict what it might have been. So they, they went to Bethlehem and uh, Matthew introduces again saying that the star guided them and was visible and so with the help of the star in a way they found the house and within the house uh, the mother and the baby, Joseph for example, is not mentioned at all in this uh, scenery. There are lots of sort of astronomical predictions, possibilities as to what this, uh, this strange event was that, that uh, precipitated the wise men wandering all that distance. All it says about the wise men is that they come from the east. Those from the east are interested in things like uh, astrology, astronomy, maybe there's no distinction between these two. Um, so it's surmised that because they've seen this star, because they've read the symbols, of, uh, the signs if you like, and said that this star means that a king of the Jews is to be born, then it's uh, surmised that they are astrologers. As I say, perhaps the, you know, the one that's been around the longest and perhaps the dullest is this thing called a planetary conjunction where you have, say, Saturn and, and Jupiter very close to each other in the sky. Um, and this is something that, that astrologers kind of get very hung up about. They think that it actually means something of great significance when you have one of these conjunctions, especially between the major planets. Uh, so th this is the, the sky on uh, 12th of November, 7 BC, um, that you would have seen if you were standing in the desert in Bethlehem. This is a southwestern sky and you can see Saturn and Jupiter very close together on the sky. It's like half a degree or a degree separate. So if you are, I mean basically, you know, the, the planets are at very, distant, very different distances away from you and they're both orbiting around the sun at their own speeds. Um, and once in a while they just appear close to each other in the sky. Uh, they're not obviously physically close to each other, but it's just one's more or less behind the other. So they're probably, you know, within half a degree or so, so within about the size of the moon of each other. This uh, meeting, in a way, was seen three, three times because of the, the different speed of the movement of the planets, although they just cross each other once. But it, if you look from the Earth, it looks as if they would meet three times, and this actually happens from July till November. This makes a lot of sense in connection with ancient astrology, because the, the planet Jupiter and the planet Saturn, they had a specific meaning. And this meaning can also give a kind of background for the story in Matthew. The thing about conjunctions is they happen all the time. You know, there's one every few years, a major one every few years. So it's not very hard to come up with a major conjunction occurring sometime around the time that the wise men were probably heading off towards Bethlehem. Um, and as such, you know, it, it could be the explanation, but given that these astrological conjunctions happen so regularly, why did that one cause such a, a major event in their lives and, and others didn't? So Jupiter is always seen as the kind of kingly planet. That means he represents kingship because he's the, the highest god in the Roman pantheon. And Saturn represents the ancient god of Kronos, that means of time. The, the meeting point of these two planets uh, actually happened within the zodiacal constellation of Pisces. And Pisces was seen as a representative of the land of Israel or of the, this area of Syria, Palestine within the, or on the celestial map. And so that means a king, a time, a time of uh, a change of time, and the land of Israel, and this makes it understandable that this wise man, that means these astronomers coming from the east, ask in Jerusalem who 
or where is the newborn king of this country, of the Jews? The, the, those planets were very close together the whole year long. Yeah, this, this is now thought to be uh, the, the star of Bethlehem, um, especially because there's, I didn't show this, but the, um, in the ecliptic, um, the software doesn't show that, unfortunately, in the ecliptic, there's a lot of dust. So there would be, um, if you calculated this in, there would be a cone of light starting at Saturn and Jupiter and then lighting going, going towards the Earth. And so the other ones which are a little harder to test is um, there are various things that occur when stars blow up, for example. Um, so there's these things called supernovae, which are kind of the death throes of a star. Uh, and then there are novae, which are kind of events very late on in the lifetime of a star that don't completely destroy the star, but are kind of the, in, it, in its final stages of its life. And these things are, uh, it, uh, can cause the objects to brighten enormously. So you can actually have what appears to be a blank patch of sky suddenly lighting up with, a, with a, a, what the ancients used to refer to as guest star, something which just lights up for a few weeks or months and then goes away again. And obviously because these things are a lot more random, it's a lot harder to test whether one of these things actually happened in the right time frame because you can't wind the clock back the way you can with planetary conjunctions and say, ah, oh, yes, one will definitely have happened around then. But the, both the Koreans and the Chinese astronomers in that time frame were actually recording these events. And there is actually, they recorded one of these guest stars appearing, um, again, in this right time frame of, of uh, just in the immediate years BC. Another important place that we have the star of Bethlehem is on top of our Christmas trees. So this is an excellent example of a star there. And another comet which was a popular one for a long time was Halley's Comet, which comes around very regularly. In fact, it's a very famous painting uh, by Giotto showing the, the, the adoration of the Magi. And at the time Giotto was making his painting, Halley had just made one of its appearances. And so he actually sort of borrowed it as to, to stand in for the Star of Bethlehem. So there is a famous painting in which the, the, the Star of Bethlehem is in fact shown as Halley's Comet. Um, Halley's Comet came around in 12 BC, which is a little uncomfortably early. You know, people want this event to be happening sort of somewhere between five and 10 BC. Um, so it's probably too early for, it to, for Halley's Comet to have been the one, but there are other comets that just come through the once and it could have been a comet.